So, well, I, I think uh, um, just like to welcome you on behalf of the K Club, Steve, and thank you for giving us this interview today. It will be really good to hear how you and Music Magpie have been getting on during lockdown and um, moving into beyond shortly. Um, last time we met in person was at City, I think, when we established that you were indeed taller than Patrick Vieira. Oh, that's um, right. So, so, missed opportunity there, really, Steve, because you could have played that midfield spot for City, couldn't you? I, I think it about to go in goal, Sarah, rather than in, in centre midfield. But, uh, yeah, I, I didn't quite have his uh, footballing talent, unfortunately. So, yeah. a bit of a shame. I think he's only about six foot four, though. So, obviously, you know, you, t you were towering over him that day. Yeah, I was looking down on him. Yeah. <laughs> so, I thought it might be useful for... Um, people listening to this Steve to just understand a little bit more about the music magpie business first just so that everyone I mean I think a lot of people do know of your business but I think that would be useful if you could just tell us a little bit about, about the business. Yeah of course I mean as you say hopefully some people have heard of it but I mean others that may have heard of it just think oh is that the business that buys your old CDs and DVDs and games, because obviously that was what we did for many years and it was all we did. But yeah, the business originated in, in, in my garage. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Walt, and I uh, co-founded it from um, basically a, a history of uh, having retail CDs and DVDs and games in new condition. And we realized that nobody was offering cash for CDs, DVDs and games as people were starting to exit them. Uh, and move into a digital world. Um, so we started in 07, 08, um, literally just out of a garage and then taking a small, one of these big yellow storage units and just a, a thousand square feet uh, alongside one shop uh, um, <clears throat> and just trading. And really from the outset, uh, I guess operating what we now call, and I still use this phrase, the lazy man's eBay model, where um, we've surveyed actually and found out that 80% of the UK's population won't sell on eBay. It's, it's too much hassle and time and effort and inclination and whatever technical confidence that they need to do that. So if we can offer them a, a really fast and uh, qu quick and hassle-free uh, way of doing that, so from the, those early principles with CDs and DVDs, you could scan the barcode, it offered you a price, you built a basket of what uh, you were selling to us. Uh, typically, people were selling us anywhere between 50 and 100 units. Uh, we were paying, again, typically on average about 40, 50 pence per unit, ranging from 5 pence to 3 pounds. Um, and we provide the logistics for it. So you put, you threw your old stuff in a box. We gave you the label. We came and got it for, for you, or you dropped it off at a convenience store. And when it arrived with us, we'd check it off, make sure it was what you said it was, and pay you for it. And actually, 12, 13 years later, the business has evolved and, and grown fairly significantly since those days. But that's very much the principle uh, of the business model. I guess where we've evolved in recent years is in three or four different directions. But a few years ago, obviously recognizing that CDs and DVDs did only have a certain uh, lifetime uh, left in them, um, we introduced consumer technology into the product mix. And now we are the UK's biggest uh, mobile phone recycler. But it's much the same principle of when you're selling to us you go on, tell us what phone you've got, what condition it's in. We offer you a price. We come and get it from you. The day it arrives with us, we'll pay you the money into your bank account. So very much, as I say, that sort of hassle-free, easy, lazy man's eBay model. Um, and I guess that's what most people know us for, whether it is on the physical media side or the consumer tech. Great business. And um, I was thinking probably, if anything, you've seen... Busy times have you, um, Steve, those have been your challenges or, or what have the challenges for you and the business been as you went into lockdown? Even? Yeah, um, absolutely. Our challenge was very different to, I, I would say, most other businesses. And, and in some ways I've, I've wrestled with that with a little bit of guilt and embarrassment about, you know, so many poor businesses were struggling with the, uh, the pandemic and 
all the restrictions on business that it brought and cons changing of consumer beh behavior. But I guess as well as people wanting to sell to us whilst they were at home, they had time, they wanted to declutter. Obviously, maybe they did want some cash for their old uh, stuff, but actually uh, the reselling of all our products, so uh, everything we buy from a consumer, we re refurbish, make it look like new, in the case of a, an item of consumer tech, put a 12 month warranty on and resell it back to consumers. So if we now think about both sides of the business, physical media, CDs, DVDs, games, and in particular books became extremely popular with people being at home, uh, looking to be entertained. Um, actually the streaming market is quite fragmented these days in terms of you need Netflix, Sky, um, um, uh, Disney Plus, Britbox, um, you know, you, you actually have all those different streaming alternatives. So people buying a film for two, three, four pounds from us became very popular again. Um, books, uh, as I mentioned before, our book sales have trebled in the last three months uh, as people have returned to enjoying books and having more time to read. But I guess that was only um, 30 or 40 percent of the story by far the biggest side of, uh, of our business now is that consumer tech and of course people were now working from home and looking to stay connected with their colleagues and workplace and actually the sales of phones tablets laptops and games consoles uh, back to the entertainment piece absolutely went through the roof and uh, frankly for us the challenge felt like holding on to the racehorse not swamping our operations i mean keeping our operations going throughout this whole pandemic period, especially if you think back to those early weeks um, uh, uh, when everybody was very uncertain and very unsure about who should be open, who shouldn't, are we safe, are we even safe to leave the house? So we did a lot of work in the operations. The government did actually not only allow online retail to stay open, but it encouraged online retail to stay open. Um, so from those early days, we were extremely busy um, and, you know, mercifully, and, and we do feel blessed for it, very lucky um, to, to be in this position where we have traded very well throughout it. During that time, Steve, were there any particular challenges for the business or for you, maybe some surprises in, in there when, as you were sort of getting the team together and getting everyone sort of ready for for what you presumably thought might be an upsurge. So. I think the biggest concern, Sarah, was purely about our colleagues and working with them, going talking to them, and me physically going into the operations and, and, and helping our senior ops staff. Our operational staff have been the heroes of our business for the last three months. Mm -hmm. It was them that, as I say, you know, when their next door neighbour had been furloughed and was looking over the fence in the morning going, why are they still going to work? They, they work for a business that sells CDs or, or mobile phones. That's not essential. You know, there was a lot of concern and worry and, and um, we physically had to make a lot of changes in our operation very quickly. So um, spacing workstations out, changing shift patterns, staggering breaks, uh, changing canteen procedures. Um, installing the very visible lines that we're starting to see now in more public environments to keep people apart, especially on entry and exit to the building. But really, I think the main challenge, Sarah, was for me and my senior colleagues to be not seen to be breaching lockdown and, oh, hang on, we've asked all our office colleagues to go and work from home and now they're going and working from uh, the, the operation, but equally to be seen um, you know, I did go in one Sunday morning just to go and see the shift arriving and I, I guess a bit, you know, of hearts and minds really, just to listen to the concerns, understand them, tell them what we were go doing, listen to if they had any suggestions, but ultimately a big part of, of actually was it was saying, look, you know, we completely respect and understand if despite all this, you don't feel comfortable being here, you are, we will authorise you, you know, un, unpaid. And sorry, we can't pay you to to sit at home because otherwise everybody would do it. And frankly, we wouldn't have a business. But we won't ask you to choose between coming in and your job. So you can have authorised leave. 
And I think people just got comfortable that we cared. Um, we weren't going to dismiss them. Uh, and, w and we were looking after people. So that, I, I guess that was the big challenge for the business for the, certainly that first month or two as people got more comfortable uh, in the working environment. And how did you keep the communication going through that, that time? Because there was, it was quite a long time that we were there in, in lockdown and I guess operational staff were still going into work and the office staff were working from home. So, so how did you manage that, Steve, in terms of communication? Um, both with extensive written cons to into the operation, but as I say, nothing could be face to face and actually making myself available, socially distanced, of course, to go round and talk to them and meet them and be there and listen to their concerns. And, you know, one of the very early concerns was how difficult it was um, for um, lunch arrangements and eating and catering. All the shops were shut. Um, you know, to, to even make sandwiches was difficult. They had to battle the supermarket queues. Um, so actually there was a, um, a, a catering van at, at, at our gate and he's a, been a friend of mine for a number of years. He's done me more than one or two bacon and egg sandwiches over the years. So I talked to Ian and said, look, would you provide the catering for the whole site for both the day shifts and the night shifts? So drop them off when convenient, but basically provide them a meal. Um, and that went down great with everybody. And it was our pleasure to do because it was something tangible that we could do to help people um, and, and uh, you know, assist them at that time of, of, of great difficulty. I think the other side of the equation is then the office staff. Um, you know, we we're really proud to have got 175-ish people home uh, within 48 hours of, of lockdown. In fact, we did it the week before the full lockdown. Uh, when people were encouraged, not instructed to, to go home. We got everybody home that week. Um, obviously, there was one or two IT issues, make sure everybody had the right equipment, getting screens home to people if they needed a second screen. Um, but really, I guess, you know, your question was about the comms, mm -hmm. and it's just you cannot communicate enough. And, you know, there is no such thing as too much comms. And doing what we're doing now, talking on video constantly to people. It is a new way of working. And that includes once a fortnight, uh, we have a company wide. So everybody dials into Zoom and they'll hear from me for 20 minutes or so, just giving a company update where we're up to, what we're working on, how it's going, what, you know, what this week, what next week, talking to them about what the future might look like as we're now into this recovery maybe moving back into the office thinking about that stage but just regular comms with the team and they've really really appreciated that well I hope they have uh, that is the feedback we're getting and I guess you've got I, I've noticed with friends you know you've got people with very different home circumstances so even working from home isn't the same cup of tea for everyone same barrow for everyone is it you've got some people who were trying to homeschool with partners on alternate sort of yes yeah absolutely you can see from my background here i'm in my man cave uh but i'm in the basement of my my home my uh two of my three girls still live with me that they're, they're quite grown up now they're perfectly capable of looking after themselves um i've been really quiet i've been very fortunate to have this space a lot of space good working environment i've so felt for some of my colleagues who've, who've had ch children in particular, but also pets at times. How many meetings have we all had with, you know, there's been a cat crawling across somebody or my, uh, my CMO, my marketing director in particular, has a very beautiful, um, very cute young daughter, Eva. And uh, we'd regularly connect to a video call and she'd be sat literally squarely on his head, um, <laughs> prodding him and it's a real real challenge for people and you know that that has been the big adjustment and recognizing people's different circumstances but you know again as an employer and as colleagues you can only say look if it is too challenging we are very happy for you to work flexibly you know if you need to come back in the evening and you know do a bit more because you were you know tied up in the day schooling or feeding the children or 
you know whatever that that's been fine with us so yeah it's um, it's been inter- it's been a fascinating actually studying sort of business and social life and i think there'll be a a, a, a case study for many years to come about the changes that it's all uh, it'll bring for all of us yeah. and how are you approaching sort of that going back into the office or or whether staff still are wanting to some work from home maybe a little bit or something yeah. it's been really interesting sarah because i i guess i would uh, profess to being quite a dinosaur and quite an old-fashioned kind of attitude before this where you know I, w- I want I want my people you know I want to be able to talk to everybody and see them and you know it, if they work for a moment they're just going to sit on the settee in their underpants watching uh, you know this morning or whatever um, it's been really a revelation for me uh, and I think a lot of you know our team to see that we've worked really, really well. Um, and, um, you know, certainly if I take our customer service staff um, who work, do work probably fairly independently of, of their team most of the time, so they're answering queries on live chat or email, mm-hmm. actually it's been really flexible. And what our head of customers told me on a number of occasions is absenteeism's down because it's just easier for everybody to get to work and they're more inclined to do so. Um, Productivity's up um, because they're more comfortable, more flexible um, and just quieter, I guess. Um, And um, actually more flexible in terms of when they're talking to customers. So I don't think, I think we're already at the stage where we're very unlikely that we'll ever bring all that team back into an office environment. I think that's not the case with everybody and all the teams. I think some of the teams who work more collaboratively um, will still benefit from spending time together. But I think there will be a mix of both going forward. Undoubtedly, uh, it will be a blend of working from home and office time going forward. And how have you managed? I know there's a US part to the business, Steve. So how have you managed... um, to keep that going across with different um, sort of strategies going on from the different governments as well. Yeah, it it has been a challenge and uh, of course they are five hours behind us. So, I mean, actually at times it's helped because we could sort of focus on the UK during the day and then think about the US and the operations and talk to them later on in the day and and into the evening. There was a point very early on in um, uh, April where we believe the governor of Georgia, which is where we're based in Atlanta, Georgia, was going to fully lock down and all businesses, so including online, would be closed. Uh, and actually, we moved a lot of our highest value tech stock back to the UK uh, very quickly. Uh, so as it wasn't trapped, inverted commas, in a, in a locked up building. Um, but actually, that didn't happen. We had to stay abreast of of what the news was over there, try and watch as many of the conferences. Obviously, we've got a management team over in the US who do a wonderful job for us, very trusted, very hardworking um, uh, folk over there, and a lot of reliance and trust placed in them. Um, Unfortunately, obviously, we can't geographically visit them, and I don't suppose we're going to be able to for some time yet. Um, but actually, again, part of this whole new way of working and living is talking to them on video a lot and keeping in touch with them. And actually, we do manage most of the group functionality from the UK. So whether it be finance or IT or commercial, um, you know, everybody in the UK regularly talks to their counterpart. Um, and again, I think, you know, we've done a reasonable job actually of staying in touch with them, keeping them comfortable. Um, and, and actually, again, we've performed very well in the US in, in the recent months. So, um, you know, if that's certainly uh, uh, helped things along. That's great. And have you had any feedback from staff or done any surveys, Steve, to see where they want to go as they start to ease out of lockdown or, or yeah. how they felt about the comms? Because I've heard that some companies have just seen a higher level of trust employee to employee just because you're having to have that trust because of the remote working more so absolutely what what we found so um it was about three weeks ago that 
uh, myself and our uh, group HR and um, talent director uh, surveyed all office staff who were at home and said, first question was, how are you feeling? Just on a score of one to 100, you know, how are you going on? Where are you up to? And the average score was 77, which was probably higher than we thought. Um, and various other questions about, you know, is there th anything we could have done better? Um, so actually broadly, really quite positive and, and heartwarming, dare I say, that people felt positively about how we were engaging. Um, we asked them how they felt about the future and um, said, uh, you know, do you see in the future, would you choose to come back into the office 100% of the time, do a blend of working from home and uh, an office, or just spend all your time at home. Only five people out of over 150 people told us they wanted to come into the office all the time, um, with the majority saying they wanted to do that blend. And that's absolutely what we will look to do in the future, I'm sure. Um, mm. So really, really insightful mm. uh, in terms of just people's, I guess. You know, I mean, I, I, even from a personal point of view, I miss the office, I miss the social interaction, I miss, I guess, you know, leading people in person and from the front and you know, being able to walk around and chat with people. But actually, you know, in terms of quality of life, you get an extra half hour in bed in the morning, which is very nice to avoid the commute. Um, I've, I've attended family tea more times in the last 10 weeks than I have done in 10 years, which is <laughs> my, my bad and shame. But um, food doesn't have to taste nice when it's... Uh, freshly prepared rather than out of a microwave two, two, two hours later. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's just a whole new way of working. But I think the staff have been very positive and they reacted really positively. We did something uh, last week. Again, it was myself and Rachel who worked on it, but we, we designed a hoodie for them, a uh, light grey hoodie. And um, basically it was one of our Magpie values. So we've got various Magpie values and it was Magpies better together, um, even apart. And we did it in the pattern of the NHS rainbow, yeah. um, which is close to all our hearts, and then the Music Magpie logo across the front. And we sent every single person who's been working from home that with a little postcard saying, you know, we miss you, uh, we've not forgotten you. Uh, I hope that, and actually, it was uncanny. We timed it and they arrived the day that the weather broke out of the... Uh, uh, the hot weather we were having. Oh, uh, perfect. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so if it had arrived a day earlier, everybody would go, what have they given us this for? Um, but yeah, now it's nice when you're dialing into something and so many people have got them on. So yeah. we hope that made them feel good. And, and do you think, um, Steve, that the consumer base has sort of, there are some people who were shopping online who weren't before because they found a way of doing it because that's been the way forwards for them during this time. Absolutely. I, I think this is a permanent um, structural change to the way a lot of people shop. I think there was obviously that migration from offline to online. It was about a quarter, uh, somewhere between 25 and 30% of retail was spent online. John Roberts AO, recent, AO recently said that he felt it had moved five years of acceleration in five weeks. I tend to agree with him. Um, I listened to the head of retail for KPMG tell me about um, the change in uh, China, where obviously it's a number of weeks ahead of where we are. Um, in China, 28% of retail spend was online pre-COVID. Um, obviously, COVID struck, shop shut. Shop, shops have now reopened but online is still now 50% of spend. So there's been that massive acceleration where, you know, I think a number of, in particular, older people have grocery shopped for the first time. And actually, do you know what? They found out they could do it, you know, and thought, this is easy. A man brings you the stuff to the door. This is good. So I think, actually, it's just retraining people into, well, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm more comfortable online shopping Frankly, it's safer. I feel like a, you know I'm happier sit, sitting in my own home, allowing somebody to bring it to me. Um, so yeah, I think I think this is a you know a real acceleration of that shift from offline to online. And, and you know I say that with some you know that's really positive for our business. 
but I'm a retailer by trade. I grew up in a shop. My dad had me behind the counter when I was 11, 12 years old. My heart really bleeds for the poor retailers who were already really challenged. And this is, you know, another significant challenge for them. Yeah. I, I guess it will, for them, just be trying to find that experience. And it's got to be a safe experience, hasn't it? So that, that then the challenges. Absolutely, and I think so much hinges on that social distancing measure. You know, I've, I've sat on the Stockport Resilience, uh, Economic Resilience Board, and we've met two, three times a week, and we've been hearing from the hospitality uh, folk who, you know, two metres, you know, I'm a great, we've, you know, done nothing but talk about protecting the NHS and, you know, we run a scheme to raise money for their charity, but... Um, we have got to now think about the practicalities of life in if this stays at two meters no hospitality service can can operate viably with with that in place so you know i think we've got to think really long and hard about that now about actually can we make that a meter um and and, and at least give uh, pubs bars and restaurants half a chance at, at being valuable uh, viable you just mentioned there um, your charitable fundraising, Stephen. I remember when we first met, it was with regard to a charitable aim, yourself and Music Magpie. So are you still then um, doing something on that charitable front with, with the business? Yeah, very very much so, actually. And actually, I mean, uh, our great performance during this period has, has allowed us to do that. And, and, and uh, you know, it's been a great pleasure and pride for... The business we have done further activity with um, city and the community actually and um, a few thousand uh, children's books uh, uh, distributing them into their uh, children's charity partners but the main initiative that we've done is um, with the NHS charities together so early on we uh, decided really simple scheme and we just said look for every tech item that we bell, uh, buy and another pound for everyone that we sell, we will give a pound. So everyone, every item into the building and every item out, we will give a pound. Um, and so far, I think the running total as of this morning was over £140,000 that we've raised since the start of April. We're going to run the scheme until the end of June. We're hoping we can get that over £200,000. Uh, we pay over every Monday morning based on the previous week's results and it has become a source of great pride uh, for all of the business everybody's got behind it we sort of have a blue peter sort of old-fashioned uh, barometer of uh, where we're up to with the fundraising so um it's it's been you know real heartwarming stuff to see how much people we've also allowed customers when they've sold to us if they chose to get donate their money uh to the same cause as well which has topped that amount up which has been brilliant so if anyone's listening to this and um, wants to go to Music Magpie, they can be, be helping with, you know, if they're going, moving house, decluttering, or whether they're looking for tech, then, um, then they'll be yeah. contributing to that charitable effort. Yeah. yeah, every single item, tech item that they sell or buy, we will be throwing another pound into the, uh, into the initiative. So, um, okay. yeah. That's been, it's been great, you know, to, to uh, you know, as I say, just general source of, you know, at times like this, we all have to pull together. And whether it's as businesses, as people, as charities, you know, we are looking as well at how we can support more local charities. You know, we work with um, Wellspring in Stockport, the local homelessness charity, uh, in trying to support them. Uh, we've donated um, over 200 tablets now into health authorities uh and and uh, care home environments where obviously you know with the visitor restrictions a lot of that communication has been through tablets and um supporting hospitals do that so it's um yeah doing what we can really yeah. um at, at times of need i'm sure that's very motivational for the staff um of music magpie as well because you can you can see you know that your business is really supporting charitable effort locally or NHS it's, it's amazing yeah we, I mentioned Magpie Values earlier on the first and foremost uh, we always talk for many years about being a Magpie and uh, dear Lorraine who sits on reception at Magpie for many years she is the 
quintessential magpie in many ways, but she defines what magpie is. And But we'd never actually written it down and said, well, we always talk about somebody's a magpie or not magpie. And actually, if somebody had said to me, what's the first quality about a magpie, somebody who works for magpie, I would say it's it's they care. Four letter word, really simple, magpies care. And that is the key word here with what we're doing. They care about each other, they care about the business, they care about the community, they care about the environment um, and, the, and the customer. So all those things together, and I think that's what this initiative encapsulates in many ways. And um, if you had to pick one key learning point as a leader that you, you know, could be, you take out of the whole experience of, of lockdown and managing the business um, through that and coming out the other end as well, Steve, what, what would it be, would you, would you think? Um, I think um, I go back to that kind of being seen to uh, lead from the front, be visible, um, be accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everybody in the business is encouraged to um, email me. We have all sorts of um, communication forums. We're all on Teams. We've, we've got Yammer for some of the more social stuff and the more informal stuff. Um, but actually, we, you can't be just being visible in front of somebody talking to them and you're no longer Steve in the ivory tower and oh, I've never seen him I don't know who he is and but actually I'm, I'm you know I'm here to talk to you you can have as much time as you like and I want to listen to your concerns um, and that is whether you are a warehouse colleague or whether it's my dear friend Ian my CFO my work wife um, you know we, we spend a lot of time together across all the different people we want to be able to be communicating with each other and be accessible. And I think, you know, that that's been the key point. Everybody has been uncertain and frankly, a bit scared at times. Um, and, you know, I put myself in that category. This was all, this is generational, once in a generation kind of stuff going on. And we were all a bit like, oh, hang on, you know, what, how's this going to work? What's happening? So to be out there and talk to people, make yourself visible, been the key learning for me. That's great. Well, thanks from the K-Club for doing this interview with me today, Steve. Good luck to you and team over the next few weeks and months. And uh, we look forward to hopefully having the chance to see you in person speaking at a K-Club breakfast next year. I hope so. There might be a little bit more football if we do it in person. And um, I'll... <laughs> I'll tell you one or two of the stories out of the uh, Magpie uh, history as well. But um, yeah, obviously good to talk today about sort of the, the learnings and the key bits of what's been going on in the last three months.